Well, hello there and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. And today we are continuing to go down Night Fighter Row, so to speak, the dark of night. As I said, we're getting closer in Halloween, getting scarier and scarier, right? Uh, and we are going to talk today about the Bristol, the bow fighter. But first, really, what, what are we thinking? Oh, maybe this is a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. I, I don't know. Like, did you like that one? Do you like that one? Uh, I have no idea what the, the, this concoction is on my head, but I'm going to go ahead and get it off here and toss it off camera. There we go to the Kenny. So we're talking about the bow fighter today. Now, as we have talked about a lot of night fighters, this is the type, the 156. I give you a plan view of the aircraft. The uh, 156 was one of those stopgap airplanes, but ultimately turned out to be incredibly versatile as well. The first flight was in 1939. Uh, it was introduced in 1940 retired in 1960. I'm going to tell you about that, which is, is kind of interesting. There were 5,928 of the type built. Bow fighters, a name to thrill, a name to strike terror in an adversary. Stories of the exploits of these aircraft as day and night fighters have begun to reach the public. Now you may see them in the construction stage. Lines of magnificent looking craft nearing completion in their sheds. The output of these twin engined fighters has already reached mass production figures. But in spite of this, each one receives that little extra attention which has made British planes the finest in the world and you'll observe that women are contributing a share of this skilled work. So this aircraft was based on this whole, again, heavy fighter concept that these aircraft were gonna fight their way into the target and that they were gonna take on uh, these much more nimble single engine fighters. What turned out was that just was not the case. And many of them were pressed into other roles, I, in this case, this aircraft could actually drop a torpedo. So it flew with Coastal Command, it had bombs, but one of the things that made it so interesting was its armament. A few details for the student of aircraft. The most remarkable feature of the bow fighter is its devastating gun power. There are six machine guns and four cannons. This means 8,000 rounds a minute. It could carry uh, four or six machine guns, so let's say 308 machine guns as an example, that range, caliber range, and also four 20 millimeter cannons. So you can imagine if this thing's bearing down on you with that kind of firepower, it carried a ton of firepower. But a contract had uh, been awarded for the whirlwind, which you can throw a picture of the whirlwind up, Greg, but ultimately the whirlwind was a huge uh, disappointment. I'm sorry for you whirlwind fans if you're out there, but nobody liked that airplane very much. The RAF wasn't very hot on it. I only think at the end of the day there were a hundred of them completed by the end of the war. But you can imagine that this was actually, the contract was awarded in the middle 30s and it took that long to get the whirlwind in production. So it, it just didn't happen. Now the design of the airplane was born out of the Munich crisis in 1938 when Britain said, we have to rearm, we've got to rearm. And they just started throwing types into the line. And we've talked about the Mosquito. Ultimately, the Mosquito would replace a Bristol as a night fighter, um, uh, the Bristol bow fighter as a night fighter. But the, uh, the air ministry, the British air ministry at that time uh, and the RAF were just rushing headlong into design. So what ended up happening was they eventually equipped 59 squadrons with this aircraft, if you can think about that, Greg. So it saw, and it saw everything from a role as a bomber. It could be a coastal command airplane.
as a night fighter. Now we've talked about the equipment before, the, uh, the aerial radar, basically the Mark IV uh, aerial radar that the, and then the five and the six that the British deployed in these aircraft, the equipment didn't really change very much. So it, it bounced from, from aircraft to aircraft. But with this particular plane, it did not see combat. It just missed the Battle of Britain. Its first kill was a Ju-88 on November 19th, 1940. But to tell you how quickly it took over from the Defiant, in May of 1940, it had 24 aircraft shot down at night. So it was already kind of taking over to become the dominant night fighter. S give you an idea of how aggressively used this aircraft was, there were 70 uh, aces in the RAF that became aces in this type. So it was quite prolific. So I'm going to go ahead and put that down, not drop it there. Now, let's see what Greg has come up with today. This, um, this is Cafe Azteca. Hmm. And this is a Taylor's Tonics Sparkling Spiced Espresso Cola. Now we're shooting this one in the morning, actually. So Greg, is you're thinking of me here. Uh, let's see, Taylor's, it's based upon a traditional recipe of energizing and flavorful botanical cola. Hmm. Uh, we'll have to try it here. Uh, let's see, 95 calories. So down on the calorie count, you're thinking of me there, Greg. Uh, let's see. I don't see the Pure Cane Sugar Mafia has not bought off these guys, so we're, we're not doing that. Now, if you were in one of these aircraft and you're one of the 59 squadrons, this plane had some challenges in that it wasn't inferior, but it wasn't incredibly fast either. The aircraft fully loaded was about a 320 mile an hour airplane. If you're up against, let's say German fighters, it was used in the Far East. So with the Zeros, it would have actually been uh, a little bit on, on par. The Zero was obviously much more maneuverable, but or any of the Japanese uh, interceptors. But the German fighters that were flying uh, upwards of, one of these actually got up to 355 miles an hour but it was stripped down. And then when they actually put the equipment in it, they realized that it was much slower. And so they had to be really careful how they deployed it. But if you were a night fighter ace, or you were involved in this aircraft in coastal command or in the search, this was a search and rescue airplane, I salute you. Hope for the best, just not there, Greg. It's a little bit, uh, just a wee bit, um, it's flat. And, uh, oh, the finish is just, it's nasty. It's not as terrible as some of the stuff you serve me, but I think I will stay away and, and just stick with my Starbucks in the morning as opposed to espresso cola. So uh, the aircraft continued to um, to fight it out. Now they had they did have some interesting problems with power plants with this. The British had a, a engine type called the Hercules. They they put different types of Hercules engines on the airplane, but then they ran into the ability to produce them because different services were uh, competing for the materials. So this is one of the few types that also had Merlins on it. So Greg, if you can find the aircraft. You would either have it, now think about that for a second, you have a radial or an inline V-12. The V-12 had a slimmer fuselage and, and was a little bit faster. But depending on the type, they, they could uh, end up being around. Now the airplane, I would argue, is probably functionally obsolete as a type by about 1943. And it was gradually more and more replaced with the Mosquito, an airplane that we'd already talked about but it did make it all the way out to the end of the war. Um, 
But at that point, it kind of moved on into history. Now, the interesting thing about this was that this aircraft was used in the Greek Civil War, post-war, so it continued to fight. It was used by Portugal, Turkey, and the Dominican Republic. And the most amazing thing about it was that the Israelis also used it for a period of time in, uh, in their uh, endeavors, aerial endeavors, uh, in the late 40s and the early 50s. So the airplane did have a versatile life uh, after, but then it kind of went on. They are slightly represented in museums. There's a few of them running around in museums. It would be an interesting type to have. And also, there are a number of them, Greg, in the water, especially in the Mediterranean. So there's a lot of dive sites with these aircraft for whatever reason, they, they didn't survive. And uh, they ended up becoming uh, fish, fish houses, I would say, right? So now if you would like to amaze your friends and bring them over and have coloring book parties for World War II like Greg does. Greg doesn't tell anybody, but he does do that. Uh, you can get this fantastic book by uh, Copeland, and it is fantastic. It, it is wonderful. It's got a lot of neat illustrations in it, but it's the story of World War II. So click on the link and order that. Now remember, we cannot do all the stuff that we do without your generous donations. I am standing once again in front of this Mark 14 Spitfire. Uh, we can't restore these and fly these kind of airplanes without your help. So click on that link, give us a donation. If you came across us on YouTube and you like what you see, all we do are long form uh, aircraft uh, warbird videos, please give us a subscription, give us a comment. Sometimes you may think I'm right, you may think I'm wrong. Give me a comment. If you came across us on Facebook, give us a like and a comment. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thanks so much. Have a great day.